For 49 days, the Buddha sat beneath the Bodhi tree without moving. Upon awakening, he taught the Four Noble Truths, that suffering can be extinguished by following the Eightfold Path. The diligent cultivation of the way the Buddha taught each of us could awaken. Our next panel, on, entitled What About Enlightenment, will examine what awakening means to each of the panelists from an experiential first-person perspective. This afternoon's panel is moderated by Buddhist teacher and artificial intelligence scientist, Dr. Nikki Mergafori. Yes, this is working. Hello. Good afternoon. It, you're almost asleep. That was not loud enough. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. Now you're, you're waking up. You know, this is the last panel of the day, and it's about what about enlightenment? Awakening is another term for it. And it's nice for us to be awake for it. And you've been sitting maybe for a long time. So I'm going to suggest we take the first 30 seconds to just get up and stretch. See what your body needs. Be kind to your body. Stretch whichever way your body wants to be stretched. Turn. <sighs> Breathe. <sighs> Feel this human, humanness in this body. In this body right now in this moment, what it's like to be here, right here, right now. Ah, thank you. Now that we're a little more oxygenated, maybe a little more awake, perhaps. So, I wanna say just a couple of words about the panel just to set it up first before I introduce um, the wonderful panelists. So the idea of, of the conference uh, these two days, what's after mindfulness, um, I think it's a wonderful question. And the consideration that naturally comes up in the mind is what about, mind what about enlightenment, right? What about enlightenment after mindfulness? So, we feel that this is a particularly important conversation to have um, in the face of what's been called Mac mindfulness in the West, where um, the gifts of spiritual practice, including mindfulness, a lot of times have become in the service of um, productivity and capitalistic ideas instead of transcendence and growth. And many of us don't even consider the relevance of, of awakening enlightenment or whatever word you want to refer to it, we'll talk about that in a moment, um, in our lives. Sometimes we might think that, oh, it's, it's just something you read in the books, and it's not for me, it's not in my life, it's not possible in this very life. So, so the goal of this panel, of this discussion, is to um, offer an intimate, public, rare conversation about this topic that sometimes is considered taboo to talk about. And the, the, reason, the reason for this offering is to elucidate, to, to clarify perhaps, and most importantly to inspire, really to inspire what is possible in this practice, the possibility of this practice for each and every one of us. Yes, you sitting in this room, for you, the relevance of awakening enlightenment for you. So before we start, I want to ask you to think about one question you have, one curiosity, one interest, something you would like to know about awakening enlightenment. Think about that question right now.
And now let's take 30 seconds, turn to someone next to you and share with each other what your curiosity is, what you would like to learn, what would be interesting for you, what would you like to get out of this conversation, why are you sitting here spending an hour of your precious time? Please go. Okay, bringing the conversation to a close, thanking your conversation partner for having engaged with you in this way, sharing their curiosity, and you sharing yours. I see there's a lot of curiosity, it's becoming juicy. If I had a bill, I would ring it now. Ding! It works. We're trained. As Buddhists, we hear the bell. And we become quiet. Lovely. So with that, with that question, with sitting with that question, with that curiosity, with that interest, now I would like to introduce this wonderful panel that we have sitting here. So I'd like to start with Ayananda Bodhi whom I've known for a long time. And um, Ayananda Bodhi has lived as a Buddhist monastic in the forest tradition for over 25 years. And her practice is guided by the early Buddhist suttas with an emphasis on meditation, study, and integrating the liberating teachings into daily life. And I know her personally, and we both serve on the teacher's council at Spirit Rock. Delighted you're here. And sitting next to Ayan on the Bodhi is Norman Fisher, who is a poet and a Zen Buddhist priest. He's a former co-abbot of the San Francisco Zen Center and is founder of the Everyday Zen Foundation, a network of Dharma groups and related projects. His latest Dharma book is The World Could Be Otherwise, Imagination and the Bodhisattva Path. Wonderful, wonderful to have you here, Norman. And we had, I had the privilege to teach with you many, many years ago at a retreat, and it, I've missed you ever since. And to his right is Richard Dixie, whom I've had the pleasure to meet today. And Richard has been a student of the Dharma since early 1970, trained in both the Tibetan and Theravadan traditions he was the director of the Bioelectronic Research Unit in London for 14 years and is an advisor to the Kienze, am I saying it right? Kienze? Kienze Foundation and a senior instructor at Dharma College, Berkeley. Welcome, Richard. And Gail Fronsdale sitting at the end. Um, Gil is, has practiced Zen and Vipassana since 1975, and he has a PhD in Buddhist studies from Stanford. Uh, he's the founder and primary teacher of the Inside Meditation Center in Redwood City, California, where I also teach, and Gil has been a friend and mentor to me for many, many years. I'm delighted you're here, Gil. So, And I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I was introduced or not. I'm Nikki Murgafori, and I'm both an empowered teacher in the Theravada tradition, and I'm also uh, a nerd, a, an AI scientist. I wear a couple of hats, so I'm delighted to be here. So let's start with, um, 
with the word, actually. The, the, um, the translation, the often, the common translation of the word nibbana or nirvana in the suttas um, is enlightenment. But there are so many other translations, so many other synonyms. I personally prefer awakening, as I've shared already, awakening, um, as well as freedom. There's also um, liberation, the unconditioned, destruction of greed, hatred, delusion, the other shore, the peaceful, the sublime, the deathless, the island, the refuge, and many more from Samyutta Nikaya 43. So let's start with what does Nibbana, awakening, enlightenment, what, or whatever synonym you prefer, what does it mean to you? And let's start with Ayananda Bodhi, if you wish. Thank you. So um, I, I also would uh, lean away from the word enlightenment and liberation, awakening, freedom. These are words that have more meaning for me. Um, it's pretty central to my life, I would say. <laughs> Um, I would say, you know, when I first uh, came across the Buddha's teaching, I was looking to learn to meditate to help uh, manage a, a very depressed mind. Uh, this is in my early teens. And um, when I actually read the, the Buddha's teaching, the Four Noble Truths, it was such a powerful, um, it, was like a, it was almost like a, an inner revolution happened. And uh, what shifted for me was a sense of a shift from being a stuck person, you know, who is born, is going to go through a lifetime and at some point is going to die, uh, to a possibility of, pres of awakening in the present moment. And it was, it was such a powerful revelation that that could be possible. Because the previous um, kind of mental, the previous framework I had was more Christian framework, which is, which is that, you know, you're born, you go through your life, you do good things or you do bad things, or you do a bit of a mix of both. And then at the end of your life, you either go to heaven or to hell. And uh, that felt like a, a bit of a difficult uh, setup for me. <laughs> I wasn't feeling too hopeful about heaven, honestly. So, um, so this, uh, this teaching of the Buddha, uh, that awakening can be found here and now, was, was profound and, and really changed my life, as you can see. <laughs> And um, so I think when I first came across that idea, there was a sense of it was something out there, something wonderful that I, that I would get one day. And, and I even remember having an image of like a, you know, some little beautiful being floating on a lotus up there somewhere. You know, that was my idea at, at age 14, you know, of, of enlightenment and, or of awakening. And then over the years of, of um, aligning to the teachings, it's, uh, there's this sense of, it's, it's, in a way, it's our birthright. It, it's what we, we, we're born with. It's waiting to be rediscovered. And so, for me, awakening is the, is the potential that we all have, that we get distracted from and we forget and we doubt and we uh, get obscured because of our... Um, mental habits and so on and, and actions uh, but it's it's waiting to be realized by by each person in this room and each person outside of this room so that's what it means to me thank you norman uh, hi everybody nice to be here with all of you uh i don't think the word enlightenment is a fair translation of Nibbana or any of the words used in the text. But I think the reason why it's the most popular word in the West is because of the, I guess it was the 18th century enlightenment period, which was a period where uh, people thought no more having to believe in doctrines that are dictated to us by others, by the church, uh, we can think for ourselves. We can discover something for ourselves. We can be, uh, it was a dark period, the dark ages. We can be now in the light. So that's a good idea. I like that idea. 
And so I think that, that, I think that idea actually pervades the, the reception of Buddhism in the West, that we think of it that way. We think of it as not being about a doctrine. If the teachings are valuable, and I think we would all agree that they are, it's because we confirm them in our lives and our own experiences. Anyway, uh, in advance, Nikki sent out a bunch of questions, and I dutifully wrote answers to them. So I will now read you the answer. <laughs> uh, what, what does awakening mean to you? That was the question, right? Here's the answer. Go for it, Norman. Yeah. It means, it means practice, unswerving devotion to practice for the benefit of others. It means fearless unselfishness. That's my answer. Thank you. And I also appreciate what you brought in about our, uh, enlightenment predating Buddhism. And thank you for yourself. Now I'm going to have actually a, more, a deeper appreciation for the word enlightenment. Thank you for that. Yeah, Richard. Yes, so there's another translation of nirvana. And it's quite interesting. Avana is a prison. And nirvana is to be free of the prison. And the question is, what is this prison that we're caught in that we need to be free of? And this really comes back, I think, to the heart of what Buddhism is. Because I think at the heart, Buddhism is a real direct inquiry about experience and about what it means to have experience. We've talked a lot about peripheral items today. I think now we're really going to talk about the real essence of what Buddhism is about. And the vana we're caught in is something we don't expect. That's why we can't see it. If we could see it, we'd break it, we'd get free, but we don't. For example, put your hands up if you think you're here now. <laughs> you see, you're not. You're in a memory of now. It takes about 400 milliseconds to generate. We have it in our language, we call it recognition. Recognition, oh, there it is in the language. And we're living about 400 milliseconds behind events. Always, all the time. In fact, our awareness is refreshing between eight and 12 times a second. So if you just think about that, that means that 8 to 12 times a second, a display is generated for us based upon actual events, but actually recognized. And within that gap is a prison. Now, when you look at the numbers, it's really rather alarming. If you think, OK, 12 hours a day, 12 times a second, 60 minutes in the hour, 60 seconds in, I mean, 60 minutes in the hour and 60 seconds in the minute, it comes up to about half a million cognitive events per day, per sense gate. We've got six sense gates. That means it's three million prison events happening every day <laughs> for our entire life. And not surprising, our attempts to be mindful successfully, which might number in the tens, maybe twenties, perhaps even hundreds, are overwhelmed by the reality we're in. And it's my belief that that is what the Buddha was addressing. He was addressing the cognitive prison we call the here and now. And so the joke is when people say, remember, be here now, they're actually repeating the mantra of the prison they're in, not the freedom from it. And it's understanding that that is the essence of the path. I think it's probably the essence of all religions, actually. Really, it's the 400 milliseconds that's in front of our nose at all times. And really, the entirety of the spiritual path is to be found in those 400 milliseconds. All the associations, all the memories, all the doubts, all the, all the pleasures, to use the Buddhist terms, all the things we want to get rid of, all the things we want, all our aspirations, all our fears, blah-dee, blah-dee, blah, it's all there in that little gap. 
And the question is, can we ever penetrate that gap? And I think the key is to recognize that yes, we can, when we understand there is a gap. And indeed, the Buddha's first words following the enlightenment were, O oh, house builder, you have been seen. You will not build a house for me again. It's really, really striking, the statement that was made. So my view is that the varna that we need to become near of is this. And if we do so, we will find something completely beyond any linguistic structure. So there's no point in thinking about what it is. That's silly. We need to think about the prison that we're in, because that we can see, and not worry so much about what lies outside. So that's my Thank you, Richard. We'd love to come to back, back to that later, and, but for now, we're just going to go out down the line for the first question, and then we'll mix it up. Gail, please. So, thank you, Richard. Uh, I appreciate that a lot because um, I get the sense that uh, here and now is overemphasized, that uh, it's kind of held up. Sometimes it's kind of like the Buddhist god or something. It's being, you know, they're all great, and that's where you know, everything good is supposed to be. Uh, I teach people to be in the so-called here and now, but it, I think that uh, we have to be careful not to overrate it. Uh, and I think this uh, word nibbana or nirvana points to something that's uh, more valuable, more important than uh, the here and now. And uh, I myself uh, prefer to think of it as an action noun. It's not a thing or a place or a reality but rather it involves an action, and it's an action of release. And that's my favorite way of rendering the word Nibbana is as release. And uh, it's a profound form of letting go, of letting go of the prison that we're in, the attachments we have. And that uh, the path of practice that I've gone through has been a progressive series of letting go of releases. And, uh, and I think that when it qualifies as something like maybe like enlightenment, I'm not sure what it is, but that uh, when that release is so strong and so palpable that it uh, gives us a, a first-hand experience of a different way of living, a different way of being, one that's not self-centered, uh, one that is, uh, sees the possibility of dwelling without attachments, without greed, and without hate, and that that experience, maybe those things still live in a person, but the experience of being freed from those are so strong that it becomes a palpable reference point that begins working us and changing us and helping us move further into the possibility of release. And I think that our whole system is set up, our psychophysical system, if you tune in well or if you sit and get really quiet, it's, it's built, it's set up to want us to move towards that release. Uh, because the, uh, not to move in that direction is to stay suffering. Thank you, Gail. So, as a follow-up to that, it, and to make the conversation more personal, um, how do you feel that you have changed through decades of practice, both Zen practice uh, and Theravada practice, in, in the ways of emptying and letting go? And if you can share personal stories or anecdotes, that'd be lovely. And, and, and this then will become open to everyone. You're... Um, <laughs> okay, so there's another element to this which has to be understood before you can get to an understanding of release. I'm not talking to you now. Sounds a bizarre statement. But if you, when you're talking, look at yourself as you are talking, you realize that's actually true. We are not doing what we think we are doing. We're totally different from what we think we are. So the display that we live in has a displayed actor in it, which you remember is me. But we have a faculty and this is where the possibility arises, we have a faculty to see. And if we look, we see there is no actor 
Something else is going on. The words are coming out now, for example, but Richard Dixie isn't saying them, not at all. And this is true for all of us. It's really straight in front of our faces. Now, whatever that is, can be relied on. You find yourself relying on something you don't identify. It's really quite remarkable. It's a true refuge. All the refuges that you can identify are, are going to let you down. I can tell you that now. Because they're just concepts. They are put together ideas. But this refuge, which you can't identify, is totally reliable. And you find yourself relying on a capacity that you don't identify. Which turns out to be who you are. Now this is a strange realization. Perhaps we are 400 milliseconds in, in front of who we actually are. And all we have to do is rely on who we are, and then something else happens. Now so, that reliance so is, the, is, the, is the realization that one can talk about. So, wonderful. I appreciate the point you made. So I want to, to invite you to make it more personal now given with this view and with this understanding, this per perception of, of awakening, enlightenment, Nibbana, how, what, how, does that, how has that changed you, that understanding? How has that changed who you are, how you are in daily life with that? So, so this is the time that I like to take the turn to become a little more personal instead of being heady, what okay. it might be. Well, you, land, you land up with a quality that was uh, described by one Tibetan Lama rather well as couldn't care lessness. You couldn't care less. Why couldn't you care less? Because you're relying on yourself, your real self, not the care less, the care self. Now, funnily enough, we turn out to be nice, compassionate, effective people when we stop trying to be nice, compassionate, and effective people. And you see that when there are earthquakes or disasters, where people get thrown out of their idea of who they are, and they do incredible things. And you read about it the whole time. The trouble is, an hour later, they put themselves back together again, and they're back in a little box again. So I think that would be one of the main characteristics. It's the couldn't care lessness. What do you think about that, Norman? Well, um, I will take up your invitation to be personal. Uh, Unfortunately, I don't think practice has improved me. <laughs> Couldn't care less. Uh, it has made me uh, far more aware of all the ways in which I should improve. <laughs> but it really, I, I can't say, you know, I, I used to be this terrible person, and now I'm a really wonderful person. I, I can't really say that. Uh, I, I, in a way, I mean, I think actually that everything we can say about all of this stuff, to me, seems quite paradoxical. In the sense that I think I could say, and it would really be true, I haven't changed at all through 40 some years of practice. I think I could really say that it would be a true statement. I think I could also say I've changed a lot. However, that's very Zen of yeah, you, by yeah. the way. What? That's very Zen of you. Well, no, it's not Zen, it's just a fact, you know, it's just the truth. Uh, now, the thing is that so if I've changed a lot, what changed me? Well, probably everything. So I can't attribute the changes that have occurred in my life to my practice necessarily. It must have been a factor, right? But also I got older. That would have changed me anyway. I mean, you, you were always, all of us, changing anyway, right? We're changing anyway, and we hope we're all improving. Any intelligent person who would like to be decent, we hope is improving over a lifetime of just being alive. So. Uh, so I think it's quite paradoxical, but I think, like, for, well, as I said in the beginning, the main thing is that I, I'm much more aware of all the ways in which uh, my 
smallness uh, manifests. And uh, I happen to be uh, a person who's married for many, many uh, years, I think 43 years maybe. And uh, that's where I can tell in my intimate relationship to my spouse that uh, I haven't really improved much. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and she, and she, uh, she uh, will point this out uh, when the occasion arises. Uh, so that raises then a further question, like why, why do I persist in doing this all this time? <laughs> Gail would love to hear your comment. I'm, I'm not sure what to say. You, you, you want like a little detail of maybe an example of how I changed, or you want something a little bit bigger? Anything. Take it anywhere you like. Well, the little detail was that, um, uh, I think it represents a change, was uh, uh, I, some of my deepest kind of release that I had was in my time in Asia and Burma. Before I went there, I worked at Green's Restaurant. And when I came back from there, I worked at Green's Restaurant. And the people there said that when you came back from Burma, uh, before you went, it was a mess around everything you were cooking. And when you came back, it was clean. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Iron on the body. Hmm. Well, I, I think uh, there's something that um, you said, Norman, that, that resonated for me, of, uh, aware of, of one's smallness. I would say there's more awareness of when it's, I'm coming from a small place and when, when that's more relaxed. That's, um, so the awareness is, is much clearer and stronger than it was before I started practicing. It was just a big confused mess before I started practicing. And I, I really wonder how people manage, actually, without meditation, but, um, so uh, there has been ch certainly a change in my lifestyle. I live as a Buddhist nun most of my adult life, and uh, that wasn't the track I was on before I started meditating <laughs> at all. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd say there's more awareness of that smallness and, and how, when, I, when I'm in that small, contracted state, it creates problems for myself and everybody else. And so I, if, if I can catch it, then I can take care around that, whereas before I would have just been in it. And, uh, and sometimes it opens up, and there's uh, a flow, and that's wonderful. And I can enjoy that without grasping onto that and knowing that's gonna change too, and I'm gonna be back in that smallness again when the right triggers arise. So, uh, so there is a freedom in that actually. It's not, uh, it, it's not like lovely and there's no, there's no suffering, but it's, there's a freedom in being able to watch the show going on a bit more rather than being, you know, believing that I'm, I am the character. Thank you. So next I have a question specifically for you, Ayana and the Bodhi, that I want to start with, and that is, um, I know you've spent time with some highly realized beings, and if you would love to share. Thank you. I have been very fortunate uh, to have had contact with some you know, very wonderful practitioners, and uh, the one that really stands out for me, which I, I love to talk about him, and I, I'm really happy to be able to sit up here and speak about him, because I hope I can give a little transmission of his, of his being. He's, he's passed away now, but his, um, his name is Venerable Maha Gosananda. I actually want to cry when I say his name. And uh, he's a Cambodian monk, very, very beautiful, very highly realized monk, who I was fortunate to meet three times in my life, and each time was completely life-changing for me. And um, he was, uh, he, the qualities that he, he, he lived, he, he exuded, were humility, 
playfulness, uh, almost like a, a almost like a light. It was almost as though he had a light shining from him. You could put him in he, if he was in a dark room. He would just illuminate it all on his own. Uh, very very intelligent and and very simple at the same time. Uh, he had a cer certain genderlessness. He, he, he's kind of he was male, but he kind of was very feminine and. He was old when I met him, but he was almost like a, you know, he could have been three years old. So all of these qualities. And uh, he, um, one of the things that's, that really struck me very deeply, I mean, many things that struck me, but reflecting on his life, you know, and that he came from Cambodia. Um, he, he had, um, he was actually in Thailand practicing as a monk when the, the atrocities happened in, in Cambodia. And he wanted to go back to be with his people, and his teacher said, "No, stay here, keep practicing, and then you'll have something really valuable to share with your people." And he did that, and he went through enormous grief, enormous grief, and somehow came out the other side with this incredible radiance and and love and joy and responsiveness. And um, every member of his family were killed in, during the Khmer Rouge time. So he was somebody who had a lot of reason to be bitter, you know, to be angry, to be resentful, and there wasn't a trace of that in his being. There wasn't a trace of greed or a trace of hatred in him. And it's, that's, it's very rare to meet someone like that. And when you do, it kind of blows your mind. It's, it's different to any other experience. For me, it's like I've never experienced anything. Maybe the, also being with the Dalai Lama, he has a similar clarity. And uh, Vera Mahagosananda, he would, uh, you know, he was just like responding from presence and compassion and playfulness and constantly wanting to teach people the Dharma in quite a personal way sometimes, you know. He, he would tease you and, and laugh at you and, you know, I, I remember an incident where he was, he just, he was just laughing at me because he would see how lost I was in my own greed, you know, and he was just like laughing and, then it, and that with, with great kindness. And then that laughter kind of made me look at like, oh yeah, look what I'm doing. I don't have to do that. And then it was, it was like an invitation to um, start to turn some things around. And also he had the ability to, through his presence, to, uh, it was almost like a, a transmission where, you know, his mind was cool and my mind was not cool. <laughs> my mind was, was hot, passionate, agitated, you know. And, uh, there was one time when I was uh, just sitting opposite him uh, in a room full of people, full of monastics, and um, as he was talking and looking at me, uh, and, well, and others in the room, but I happened to be right in front of him, and as he was talking, my mind, which was quite agitated and, and kind, of, uh, kind of hot, let's say, and red, my mind just cooled right out, completely cooled. And uh, that, that coolness lasted for uh, like 24 hours or so, and then the old habits came back, you know. It was like I borrowed it from him for a little while. But um, for me, that was the most life-changing experience, and, and, and seeing the potential of a human being. For me, he was just like living the, the exquisite potential of a human being. And it wasn't serious, and it wasn't improper, you know. He was, he was kind of playful, and, He'd wear his robe all bundled up, and he sometimes would have a pink beret on, and you know, he was fun, you know, and, and beautiful. So uh, I'm very grateful, and I'm happy that I can share uh, just a little bit about him with you, because uh, often we don't get a chance to see someone who is that free. So uh, I love to talk about him when I get a chance, because he, he, radi he radiated that possibility that potential. Thank you for that exquisite transmission. I start to feel like I'm being cooled as you were talking about it. Any other uh, reflections, uh, memories from people that you, perhaps you've studied with or have known? In terms of teachers? Yes. Oh, oh many. Um, obviously, when you meet uh, someone who lives in their own being, they create an ease around themselves that's really striking. And it's almost best if you have a chance to travel with them or something like that. 
I remember once uh, walking behind a Thai monk through Savarmabhumi Airport. And this monk, he was just walking like one of those walking statues. His robe was hanging perfectly like the walking statue. And people just parting in front of him as he went. It was just the most sublime feeling of the Vinaya just walking. It was lovely. And when you hang around monastics, you get experiences like this. And you realize it's really a very, very special thing that we still have in the world. So many monastics, so many, you know, I encourage all Western Dharma students to go and visit countries like Thailand and see the, the, the Buddha Sasana as it was, you know, in many other countries. Um, and so just to see that is a remarkable thing. And to see, for example, monks going on arms round, oh my gosh, that is just extraordinary feeling to see monks doing that. Thank you, Richard. So having now talked about monastics, now I'd like to turn the conversation to the potential for waking up in lay life. And I'd like to direct this question to Norman and Gil, because they have worked with a lot of students in lay conditions. And now sort of people that you've seen and worked with um, as who've been your teachers now, list, uh, the question is, uh, the inquiries about people that you have seen their progress throughout year, their years towards the decades and how you've seen them change with the potential of, of this practice. So, Norman, Gail, whoever wants to go first, take it away. Uh, well, uh, uh, let me see if I can uh, say what I'm trying to say. I'm complaining about uh, Mahagosananda and the monks of Thailand. Uh, not that I'm actually complaining about them, because I also, I did meet Mahagosananda, and, and everything you say about Mahagosananda is true. So it's not that I've said something wrong. <clears throat> it's not that. It's that um, there's something inherently misleading when we hear these things because we think it's about Mahagosananda. We think that he's a really special person, or we think that these monastics that we see that are so wonderful, we think it's about them. But what if Mahagosananda or Dalai Lama were not born as monks, and, and they were born like as an African-American person in Oakland, right? And they just had a hard time. And they probably would not end up looking like that. Or suppose the Dalai Lama himself, or Ma Gosanan himself, were, were disrobed and were given a job working at McDonald's down the street. Would we, and didn't have the training, would we necessarily notice their special quality? So what I'm trying to say here is that it's not about those people. What you see when you see Mahagosananda is you see the best of how many thousands of years of history of the monastic tradition in Cambodia. You see that flower in that person or in those persons who were walking down the street in their robes. So it doesn't mean that they're not wonderful people. It means that we mistake all that goes into producing that person for the person. So I, what I'm saying, and the reason why this is all relevant to your question is that I think that we will not expect to see a person like that in our situation for a long time because uh, we don't have that ancient tradition and we don't have the social support for it as of, as of yet. So, however, then would we say, because of that, we're kind of doing like junior league practice and because we, we don't have any Mahagosanandas or any Dalai Lama people, uh, are we, are we wasting our time or do we have to wait for a thousand years? No. 
I don't think so. I think that the people that I admire the most, actually, the people that I would tell stories like this about, are people that I've been practicing Zen with, regular people, right, for decades, who are able to uh, bear their illness and death with dignity, who are able to be a support for their families, who are able to be uh, humble and simple and live their lives. And they're not as impressive, actually, from the outside as some uh, people who have been produced by a thousand years of Buddhist culture, which is a marvelous and amazing thing. But I think for us now, to me, it's just as impressive. Because uh, the world we live in is, you know, quite uh, difficult and it doesn't provide the Western world, and now increasingly outside of uh, Buddhist communities in Asia, the Asian world too, is very troubled. So I don't think we want to be saying that uh, these great practitioners are the ideal to which we aspire, because we will never get there. However, uh, there is an ideal to which we can aspire, which is to be, you know, really kind, humble people, truly, unselfishly willing to be of service to one another. And we actually can be, just I was really moved by what you were saying a moment ago, that our smallness might arise, but we don't have to be persuaded by it, as I'm sure you're not, when most of the time, <laughs> sometimes, but a smaller percentage of the time, I'm sure, than when you were young, you know. So we can, so we can, I think we can, that I think is quite realistic, quite possible, and in fact, I, I think, I, I actually feel like it is that kind of awakening, which and I would consider it to be a valuable, kind of awakening is really available, I actually think, to anybody who would practice seriously over a long period of time, because it takes discipline, it takes commitment over time. But I think if that's awakening, and I feel it is a kind of awakening that's quite valuable, then we can all aspire to that kind of ideal. And, and so I, I don't have any problem celebrating the great sages and teachers who uh, uh, we've met in our lifetime. But uh, if we think it's about them and not about the practice that produced them and the whole world that made it possible for them to achieve what they achieved, then we're, then we're, we're going to get mixed up in our own practice. We're going to practice and we're going to be really disappointed that we're not the Dalai Lama. And then we're going to give it up because, you know, I'm still the same schlump that I was before, so why bother? You know, no, I, I, think, I think we have to have, we have to be uh, clever about this and think about it more and realize that uh, in each context, awakening is going to appear differently. And I also appreciate another way to, that, that I hear that is, is really the ordinariness of awakening, really, the ordinariness of it, not to put it on a pedestal, which my hope is, you know, demystified in a way, uh, the, the, the idea of freedom, awakening. It's not something that's just reserved for, for a few, uh, but it's, it's available in so many different shapes or forms. It's available to us in day life, in daily life, in lay life. Gil, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I, li I like that, the ordinariness. Uh, I, um, I usually don't use the like, language of enlightenment or stages of awakening or things like that. If I use anything comparable to that, I, I like the word maturity, that people mature in the Dharma. And people mature in many different ways, but absolutely I've seen many lay people mature to a great extent. And it's been quite inspiring to me to see students mature and grow and develop and unfold. 
the question of lay versus monastic, um, I think that uh, lay practitioners have just as much, if they practice sincerely and dedicatedly, and um, have just as much opportunities for the kind of deep experiences of release, of freedom or letting go, as a monastic does. But the disadvantage of lay life is that it's too easy to get back, uh, come out of that experience and get swept up in the concerns of everyday life. So the experience of letting go or release uh, doesn't remain close by to be a guide or support or reference point to uh, mature further from that vantage point. And uh, so I think the art of it in, in lay life is to, uh, to whatever degree of letting go has been significant and meaningful, is to somehow keep that alive as uh, the path of practice, as to keep maturing and developing through that. Thank you. The next question is, um, I'd like to start with Norman first, because you have written about compassion extensively. Um, so is the relationship between awakening and the cultivation of compassion and love, uh, whatever word you want to put on that too. Well, uh, to me, they're the same thing. Uh, I, I, um, Alexei was gave a talk earlier about gender and so on, and she mentioned that she uh, studied at Cal with uh, Professor Lancaster, and I did too, around the same time. And I remember uh, that he he gave a seminar on. Uh, um, reading the Emptiness Sutras, uh, we were specifically reading the Diamond Sutra in Chinese. Not that I could read it, but I was trying to learn how to read it, and he was reading it with us. And I remember him saying, well, uh, in Mahayana Buddhism, they always say that uh, wisdom, the ability to understand the emptiness of all phenomena, wisdom always goes together with compassion. They say that. Wisdom and compassion always go together. He said, I, frankly, you know, studying this, these sutras all this time, I, 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 have no, I, I don't see that. I don't see what that has to do with compassion. But I believe them when they say it, so OK. But I don't get it. I remember him saying that. And now, all these years later, it just seems to me like so obvious that it's the same thing, because if you are willing to uh, not be mesmerized by your own smallness, however much it appears, uh, if, if you're willing to recognize all the really interesting things Richard was talking about, that you're, the, the reality that you are one step removed from, your, from yourself all the time, that you are not at all who you think you are, if you're willing to acknowledge all of that, then it means that Everybody and everything else is you. You're not this guy over here, right? You're not that guy over there. Everything and everyone else is you. And uh, in this very wonderful way, because if it weren't for everybody and everything else, think how lonely you would be. It wouldn't even be possible for you to be here. So naturally, you love them all. And naturally, when they fall down, you try to pick them up. And probably, you end up falling down too. But that's OK. Then both of you are down there together, and it's not so difficult. So yeah, I think that uh, I, was, I was telling Gil, and I was very happy earlier when I told Gil this, that he didn't think I was crazy. He, he, Gil actually knows stuff about Buddhism because he was a scholar. I make stuff up with a little bit, <laughs> the little bit of knowledge that I have from uh, from sutras and stuff. But I was saying to Gil, I said, you know, I, here's my outrageous idea. My outrageous idea is that uh, actually um, the Buddha really taught a life of compassion and conduct. The practice is really about 
how we treat one another and how we love one another. That's really what it's completely about. However, uh, and, and because previous to that, everybody was stuck. Who was saying? You were saying. You know, we, we all thought we were stuck in our you know, situation that we were born into. We walk down this block, and then we fall off the edge, and that's it. Um, and that's how everybody felt. But the Buddha said, no, actually, there's another possibility. You don't have to. You're not stuck with that. There's another possibility. And it's this life of transformed conduct and love. However, in India, in ancient India, you couldn't, in order to say such stuff and be credited with it, you had to be an enlightened sage. So that's why they had to make up this whole story about the Bodhi tree and sitting under there and all that, and then kaboom with the morning star and everything. That was all just to legitimize the actual message that the Buddha was teaching. Because without that story, which is really uh, a typical male hero story of the person who slays the dragon and wins in the end. Without that story, the legitimacy of the Buddhist teaching would not be credited. So, uh, so that's why uh, the emphasis, which is so comes right out of the '60s drug culture in our West, you know, the idea of I mean, which is exactly what Ram Dass used to say: "This is a far better way to get high." And it lasts longer, <laughs> you know? So I think that the whole idea of, of, of awakening as that kind of kazoom moment when everything will be different and you'll be really amazed by all of reality forever, I think that uh, it's all true, but not in, not in the way you would make it seem like it is, not at all. Thank you, Norman. So given that we have we have about five minutes left, and, and I want to give every panelist a chance to, to um, share one last thoughts about this topic. And um, maybe the way I would pose the question is, um, you know, given everyone that is here and what you've experienced, what you know, what you've seen, what you've studied, um, what would you like to leave? Of people in this auditorium with. And let's start with Gail at the end. I think that um, the, the most important thing I'd like to say here on the topic of enlightenment is that enlightenment, whatever it is, is an ethical state or an ethical experience. That uh, there's an equivalence of ethics and enlightenment. That, uh, and the easiest way to describe that is that, uh, at least in the ancient texts, the suttas, enlightenment is described as the most common description of Nibbana is the destruction of greed, hate, and delusion. The most common description of the roots, the fundamental foundations, the roots out of which unethical behavior arises is greed, hate, and delusion. As greed, hate, and delusion is diminished, it makes us more ethical, makes us less unethical. And uh, to take that all the way to its full potential, you know, as we move towards that full potential of really the destruction, the ending of greed, hate, and delusion, um, we're uprooting and eradicating uh, the source, the sources within us for being unethical. And, uh, and without being unethical, then we can live in the world with care and attention and respect and also with a wonderful sense of amazement that we're here and conscious. Thank you. Richard? Actually, as we were talking, I, you know, I think it's probably correct to say that compassion is the body of wisdom. Everything has a body, right? Um, you know, it's important to distinguish between understanding, experience, and realization. And one of the biggest problems we have as practitioners is we tend to think when we understand we've realized. That's the first thing. So you get the, get the idea of it, and you think you've got it all. And then when you have experiences, you think you've realized as well. And that's ex even more common. And experiences are gonna happen because if this is indeed a display, and you start playing around with the controls, 
the display changes and you have experiences and you think, wow, I'm getting enlightened. No, you're not. You're just playing around with the controls on the TV screen. That's what you're actually doing. And so experiences are sudden, like a flash of lightning. But realization is like the dawn coming up slowly. And I really think it's important to realize that we have to accumulate. We have to, you know, the Tibetans have a very nice term. They don't use the term meditation, they use the term gumpa, which basically means to become familiar with, is essentially what the term means. We have to accumulate something. And that takes time. Once you've understood what it is, then experiences become an obstacle because if you reify your experiences as something to follow, you're reifying the very display you want to escape. So actually experiences, it's a very nice metaphor, experiences are like saliva. It feels good in your mouth, but when you spit it out to show it to someone else, it doesn't look so nice on the floor. And it's a bit like that. So the important thing is to realize that you will have experiences as you meditate, but the best thing to do is to forget them because the realization is something quite different, feels totally different, and comes slowly and steadily. And once you start feeling it coming, you know you're on the path. Thank you, Richard. Norman, with a minute or two left. Well, I would just like to say that I was just so impressed with what Gil and Richard just said, both of them in totally different ways, so thank you. Yeah, you know, it, it is a, it's, a, it's a practice, it's a living practice. And uh, what comes to mind is, is that kind of nutshell teaching of the Buddha called the Awada Patimokkha, that's uh, refrain from doing harm, do good, and purify the mind. This is the teaching of all the Buddhas. It's so simple, it's very beautifully simple, and yet it's like a lifetime's work. So the refrain from doing harm is the ethics, you know, not harming ourselves, not harming others, learning how to stop harming ourselves and others. And then doing good, finding opportunities, little tiny things, big things, whatever it is, but finding opportunities to do good, to do something good for oneself, for, for people around us, for, pe for anyone, any human, any creature, for the planet itself. Um, and also to appreciate the good that we do and appreciate the, the ethics that we live. The Buddha also encouraged that, like recollect our goodness, recollect our generosity. It's not something that I learned when I was growing up. It wasn't sort of seen as a good thing to do, but the Buddha was really encouraging that. So, so we're kind of reminding ourselves of the goodness that's being generated and then, and then purify the mind. Purifying the mind through meditation, through through that awareness of the smallness, you know, through through hanging in there, through through bearing with, um, you know, when you when you are holding back from wanting to do harm or wanting to do something uh, that's going to hurt you or others in the present or in the future, there's a there's a purification of mind that happens then. I think we we can hold a very high idea of what it, what we sh you know we should be good, we should be always nice, we shouldn't have any bad thoughts, but it's more like to know the purification process and, and, and that know that that's part of the practice and that's part of what ripens us in awakening. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to thank you, Ayananda Bodhi, Norman Fisher, Richard Dixie, and Gil Franzel for having agreed to be part of this conversation. Thanks to all the organizers.